Thank you, Meryl. Good morning, everybody. It's great, uh, great to be with you. And uh, Kubus and Manga, thank you for, and others for inviting me to uh, share a few thoughts with you uh, about where we are and, and what's happening around us in a time that is very, very challenging. But what we know about South Africans is we've had many, many challenges. And one of the reasons I was delighted to accept this invitation is that in the last year or so, it's become obvious to me that you know, many of the challenges we have are, are sort of high-level challenges, long-term structural challenges. But institutions like this, who are able to get things done, are the core of this country's stability, its historical prosperity, its energy. And so to gather like this for a few days and share your thoughts and think about what you're going to do next uh, becomes a critical part of keeping ourselves resilient and making sure that we understand the times we're living in and have a, an understanding of the kinds of things we need to do uh, to get ourselves uh, further along the track. What I say often to people like you is how we've all got in the room and how we get out of the room uh, are not the same thing. And we're in an era of remarkable change where all of us at an individual level, at a very personal level, have got to think about the skills and knowledge and attitudes we have and think deeply about what shaped them and then think very hard and get a feel for what's happening outside your business, outside your sort of daily life and think about what it is we need to learn. So I'm going to touch on the, these themes as we go along. What I deeply believe is all of us as leaders need a map and a mirror. The map is pretty obvious. The map is for understanding where your business is, where your industry is, what's happening around you at the, at the very micro level, at the daily level. Because only at the level of detail, as, as you know, do you get the kind of insights for the higher level ideas, for the aha moments that say, we can do it this way. At the moment, in a, in a very low growth economy, if not a negative growth economy, all of us have to think deeply about what bits of process create what value, and what bits of process attract what kind of cost, and how we can think about value and cost, and this basic work you do, the core of what you do, the operational work, uh, is in play. But at the same time, at looking at what's happening around us, all of us need to arm ourselves with a sense of what is next. What is next at the big high-level stuff of the dramatically changing technologies, engineering and science that are fundamentally shifting the way we live, the way we work, the way we relate to each other. And some of these are not South African events. They are, they are dynamisms that come from elsewhere that we have to absorb. And then all of us have to think deeply about where South Africa is and what South Africa is. We, we are busy in a long-term transition. If you read the Sunday papers, uh, you would think South Africa is about to collapse. But of course it isn't. It's a long journey of transition with sometimes dramatically bad news and sometimes extraordinary news, good news. And we've got to figure out in our own direction and lives what, what that mix is. So what I'm saying to you is there are things that are global phenomena, best practices, new ways of doing things, businesses starting up with different models that are good news. And of course, wh what we know is you've got to be smarter than your lunch. Because if you're not smarter than your lunch, you are the lunch. And so all of us are busy with this deal of, of thinking through what do we do differently? And networks like this are going to help you do it. 50 years is a long time for any association to meet. And I know from having worked with SAPEX before that you're a professional group who know each other and who network and share a lot of information. But of course, you also compete. My first introduction to logistics that Mungo was talking about was by studying Napoleon and his genius as a strategist and his ability in 12 years to conquer Europe. And you all know that he was a brilliant logistician. He understood, as they said, that the army marches on its stomach. When I go to, into any business these days, whether it's a retail business, a manufacturing operation, a services business, I know that essentially what's going to happen around me is going to be driven by the kind of work you do. And so you've occupied the center stage of national competitiveness in an increasing way. And I've got absolutely no doubt 
that in the next decade or so, you'll become even more central to it. So we're all searching. We're all searching for the right-hand side of that slide. That is Darwin's little spot. The survival of the fittest. The survival of the quickest. The survival of the ones who learn the fastest. The survival of those who are able to unlearn. And so as we think about uh, this topic of what's happening around us, I think at least at every level, at the personal level, at the institutional level, maybe at, at an industry level, or maybe even as a country, we've got to find a way to fit into the world around us. Those who argue and are those who think that South Africa can just carry on uh, in an isolation are making a huge mistake. We live in a highly interconnected world in which each player, each country's strategy and delivery and efficiency and creativity are deeply connected to what is happening around them. So it's the search for the right-hand side of that equation. It's the search for the few things that your business does brilliantly that creates value that very few others can do. That's the search that I'm sure you are daily on the lookout for. There are four simple questions that each of us need to pursue, and I'm going to touch on them uh, briefly this morning. The first is the context around us, whether it's just the daily transactions, whether it's how we manage operations, or whether it's the higher level forces that are driving the change around us, this remarkable technology we are seeing. The truth is you must start with the context around you and how it's shifting. We are in a low growth environment in which efficiencies become key. But so do innovations, innovations that can change the basic logics of the business. And so understanding that and looking at the business from the outside in, one of the dangers with professional focuses is that we look from the inside out. We have a system, we have a way of doing things and we become dominantly thoughtful about delivering it. But the truth of innovation is it often starts several steps away from you with how a product or a service is actually used and being able to see it from that angle, which is sometimes extremely difficult because you are so passionate about your own business and its capabilities. So whether it's at the level of markets or at the level of industry structures, or whatever it is, you've got to look at it from the outside in. All strategy starts outside the business. The second is what we're going to do. Strategy is a subject that's occupied me for 40 years now because it's one of the most intriguing drivers of value. If you have a good strategy, it changes everything. If you don't have a strategy, you drift along. If you don't have a strategy, the world is out to get you. And as we all know, the world does not need our permission to change. So strategy is a very simple idea. It entered modern business actually through Napoleon. Funnily enough, through the Germans who studied Napoleon, he kept beating them and they got a little annoyed. And they studied how he beat them. And they wrote a book called On War by a general called von Clausewitz, in which he articulated this fundamental idea of strategy. It comes from the Greeks. It's got two meanings. One is the strategist. The individual or the team that are responsible for thinking through what the logic is of how this business creates value. And the other is the strategia, the content of the strategy. And so what we're going to mix is strategic leadership. It's no good having a good strategy if you don't have the right leadership and organization. And it's no good having the right leadership and organization if you don't have the right strategy. It's the dynamics of those two elements that lead us to the next point which is we need the right vehicle, we need the right organization. Organizations are things we design. What I've learned over the years is all work is voluntary. No job description, no performance management system, no measurement system causes people to really want to excel. And we are in a world where excellence is the norm. And so the idea of how we design and run and energize and engage with people in our companies is an absolutely vital part of leadership's role. And even though you may be technically proficient and logical in what you're doing and laying out a system, it doesn't mean that people relate to it. A few years ago, I was in Japan visiting Toyota. When I started studying the stuff, Asia was beginning to rise in the 80s. And Japan had become the obsessive focus of American businesses. 
Believe it or not, in 1980s, America was driven by the notion that this nation that had attacked them in the war, that they defeated and occupied, was growing so fast that within time it might overtake the United States. And so Americans became obsessed by studying it. And I remember so well, and I often quote the notion of Toyota in Japan. Because when I was a youngster, Toyota cars were not good cars. And the revolution in manufacturing and logistics that they've led. And I always tell the story of how in the 1980s, 30,000 workers in Toyota were able to generate 3 million suggestions in a year. Think about that. On average, every three days, an employee would make a suggestion of how to innovate the system, improve productivity, improve quality. The question is, what percent of the three million suggestions were practical enough to be used? And the answer, according to what I read, was 90%. That meant that 2.7 million suggestions were implemented in a year. And when I went to visit them twice over the last five years, I got a sense to feel the, 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 the incredible sophistication of the Japanese culture that is obsessed with detail and getting it right. Visiting the, the factory in uh, Kyoto, the, the, any worker could stop the entire production line. These kinds of learning on the spot, making sure there are no errors, are all part of the kind of seamless objectives that you all must be striding for. And then the last is the leadership we bring. And this is where the mirror comes in. Because it's in the discussion with you and I looking at the mirror to ask ourselves, what are we doing in the room? Where is this industry going? What is happening around us is the key, key decision. Because to lead is a voluntary act. To take the risk of challenging the status quo, of arguing your way around the boardroom and the exco for the vitality of what you do is no small task. And that's where self-belief and passion about what you do become so central. I want to make a, a remark about the country as you spend a few days together. This is a remarkable country. No country of this size GDP has produced more globally competitive companies than South Africa. There are many that have gone into Africa, that have gone globally with the most extraordinary results. Not all of them have prospered, but overwhelmingly they have. And it's worth today when things are tough to think about what it is that has made us so capable. I think of a business that many of you are active supporters of, if not shareholders, which is SAB Miller. Most of you, I think, are actively engaged in keeping them afloat. <laughs> SAB Miller had a monopoly, an Eskom-like monopoly on the clear beer business in this country for nearly a century. It should have produced complacency and sluggish behavior and slow reaction time. And yet, through great leadership, SAB remained nimble, agile. And when the gates opened in the 90s, SAB went into Africa, to China, Latin America, and Europe, and as you all know, became the second largest beer maker in the world. That's what this country produces. We have produced the most extraordinary companies, and that's our DNA. And you represent much of that DNA. Really quite something to think about and be proud of. But of course, the world doesn't quite work the way you want. That's meant to produce a laugh, but clearly you, you're either frozen to death or... So no plan survives the first gunshot. That's what Napoleon said. Every battle you plan for uniquely. Every battle has its own personality. Every situation we face is slightly different in some or other important way. And the job of leaders is to make sure that we understand the difference. So as I say, how we've got in the room and what we're doing in the room is not how we're going to get out of the room. And what we need to do is think about the three, the three questions at the end of that. What are the known knowns? What are the things you know about how we run supply chain that are not going away? They can you can take them as givens, and they're stable, and they're powerful, and they add value. And what are those three or four things that you and your teams understand and have insight and foresight into? But you must also know that the known unknowns. What I've learned about South African businesses that struggle is they stop thinking hard enough about the questions. 
They become maybe immobilized by the change. They become maybe dominated by fear. They become places of resistance to change. But what I know about great companies is they're constantly asking themselves the profound questions about what's the problem? What's the problem we're trying to solve? What's the opportunity we're trying to create? And what are the questions we need to ask ourselves in order to make that happen? That's the work of leadership. And then, of course, the third category is the unknown unknowns. These things that come along and somehow dramatically change the world we work and live in. And so we've got to prepare ourselves for all of those. Let me say to you that the heart of business now is the ability to learn faster than the rate of change. For mature companies, that also means to unlearn faster than the rate of change. I always tell the story of when I was a young kid. I don't know how many of you, as a young kid, ran up down escalators. Can I see a show of hands? Some of you, many of you, all right. There are three outcomes when you run up a down escalator. The first is that you change at the rate of change around you. And you keep running on the escalator and you go nowhere. You put your 40 or 50 hours in. You attend lots of meetings and look at the spreadsheets and make the decisions. But you're not actually dealing with the rate of change around you, driven by the escalator. The second option is you move faster than the world around you. And you create some new form of value, some new insight, some new process, some new system. And you get to the next floor. And the third form of activity is you move slower than the world around you and the security guard at the bottom of the escalator gets you. Because somehow you've been unable to move fast enough. And I can think of many companies, I can think of example Stutterfords that I worked with and you as a young kid and how they just simply didn't get the concept of the battlefield right. Because as I said to you, no two battles are the same. And this is the problem of memory versus vision. This is why I stress how we've got in the room is not how we're going to get out of the room. And so what we've got to do is unlearn. Most of us, certainly me, I drive the same route to work most days. If you do that over and over, you can wake up when you get to work. This is the danger of routine, the danger of, comp of repetitiveness. And so what we've got to do is think about how to take a different route and I'm going to end perhaps talking a bit about this country and what's so different about where we're headed. But before I get that, let me just ask you to think for a minute about that. The fundamental question about where excellence comes from depends on your answer to that question. What can your business do that the market wants it to do? What are your insights? That's about depth of knowledge, what the Germans called Fingerspitzengefühl, about the ability to feel a business, about the intuition, about what your eyeballs tell you after 10,000 hours, that you can look at an operation, you can look at a system, you can look at some or other part of logistics, and you can grab out the insight because of the depth of your experience, or wants it to do, or will want it to do. That's foresight. What is next? And that's why I stress so much the time for learning. I want to encourage you to work less on operations and much more on strategy. To struggle to find the time to take yourself off the normal, off the routine. To build relationships outside the business. To find people with ideas very different than yours. Because in a profession, the tendency is to cluster with the people who know what you know. And what great innovators do is search out for others who may look at it differently outside of your industry, outside of your profession, and build a network, an ecosystem of insights. If you think just for a minute about Uber, which all of us have probably used now, or Airbnb, when you look back, you look and say, wow, that's so obvious. And yet the earth-shattering capacity to create an entirely new business by Uber which is, I think, five years old and worth $40 billion, came by a group of people who were outsiders to the industry. We have to be the outsiders to our own industry. So think a little bit about that. What are the insights? What, are, are the, what is the foresight? And then thirdly, what can you do 
that the other guys can't. Because in the competitive world, in the heart of capitalism, that's the central question. You either add more value to people's lives than the rivals, or your customers will switch if they can. You can work hard on making them dependent by signing contracts and performance agreements, but the truth of business, why business is such a creative art, is our job is to find new ways to create value. And that's the core search. What can the business do that my market wants or will want it to do that my rivals can't? You may want to think a little about that in these few days and take that question back to your organization and pose it. This is the 100 meters. It's a fascinating race, this. As you all know, it's a very short race. The Jamaicans are the champions. I haven't worked out why. There are two million Jamaicans. They're largely tall and well-built fellows that run this race. I don't know if, what it is that causes them to run so fast. It may be the ganja, I'm not sure. <laughs> but something or other motivates the hell out of them. And they jump out of those starters' box at a speed that's on. If you watch this on YouTube, the Olympics or the World Champs, you'll see Usain Bolt doesn't get vertical until the 40 meter mark. And he stares down the tunnel, and all he's doing is he's psyching himself up for this transaction, this day, this piece of the system, this delivery. And for four years, he focuses his energy on a breathtaking performance where the margin of victory is so narrow, that's your business. If you watch, you know, in the 90s, they used to say, if you're a very fast runner, you never look at your competition. You focus totally on what you've got to do. Because you cannot make any form of a mistake. Because the margin of victory is so tight. And in a tight economy, the margin of victory, the margin of cost is so tight, you have to focus on it. And so they run, and at the end they put their arms out, and they try and get past the post without looking at the rival. If you look at the rival, you come third. Except for Usain Bolt. When the same bot gets to the 80 meter mark, he's normally so far ahead, he can start waving at the crowds. I suppose that's what we all dream about. We have a race in this country that's different. It just finished. I don't know how many of you have run it. This is a day long race for most of us. So this is not the 100 meters, this is not what happened today. This is about the longer term determination to make this country great to build on our heritage, to build on the platform of great business, and to have the resilience to get through this down cycle. This is about long-term difficulties. This is about tactics. This is about endurance. This is about making sure that no matter what's happening around you, you are going to make the difference you need in your world. So I encourage you to think about that. This, bizarrely or not, are people summiting Everest. When I came to Joburg, if Bank A could be, beat Bank B, it was cool. If Manufacturer A could beat Manufacturer B, it was fine. South Africa was an isolated country. Today it's not. The world is flat. Where you are actually is much less important than what you can do. And so it's crowded at the top. And you've got to constantly set higher and higher standards for yourself, for your organization, and for the industry. South Africa is a country of contrast. Like most of the world, six of the seven billion people on this planet live in these transitional emerging countries. Countries going through massive social change, economic and political change, where technology is impacting on them in ways that we've never imagined. And so this slide shows you the mix of the old and the new. And what we've got to figure out is what does it mean here? This is not Silicon Valley. We are not in China. We are not in Germany. We are in a different kind of country with an extremes with extremes. And what we're busy doing as a generation is modernizing, modernizing ourselves, modernizing our businesses, and modernizing the country. We don't all have to like each other. <laughs> it's nice if we do. We've got to get on with the business of the day. So let's get on with it. Let me show you how extreme the world is, how extraordinary this is that we live in a world of such extreme differences. This is a map of the world of people who live on up to $10 a day. And as you can see, it's China, India, and Africa. That is the next story. That is the story of the now, the economic development of these three 
huge land masses. China, 1.3 billion, India, 1.1 or 1.2, Africa, 1.1. 3.4 billion people of the world live in these large land masses. Look where the wealthy live. I mean, that just tells you the size of the opportunity. In the long run, China's done it, India's doing it, Africa is coming. It's got to come. It's the largest untouched natural resource in the world. It has a billion people, largely untouched by the products and services South Africans use by 10 o'clock. I often fly to, the, to uh, Amsterdam over the DRC. At night when I'm at 40,000 feet on a clear night, I'll look out the window and look for a light. I'll wait until I see a light, and then I'll count how long it is until I see a second light. And normally I wait 30 or 40 minutes. We've flown 300 kilometers. This is a country with 80 million people. You can't drive from Eastern Congo to the Western Congo. It is full of natural resources. It's the Brazil of Africa, if we get it right. That's our country's chance. I don't see another. I don't see us out innovating Silicon Valley. I don't see us out hustling China. I don't see us out trading India. What I see in the next 20 years, in the lifetimes of our children, is that Africa is our great, great opportunity. And South Africa has every reason to succeed in this continent. So let me leave you with that thought. But just again, look at this incredible gap that the world is wanting us to close between these two remarkable differences. You know, 70 years, three score and 10, the Bible says, is the lot of man and woman. 70 years. Of course, it's a little getting a little higher now in some countries. The Swedes are debating the retirement age should be 75. A kid born in the US today should live to 130, which means a huge market for skin cream. <laughs> but I want to show you, just for a second, how the world has moved in one person's lifetime. Let me show you. So on the vertical axis is how long you live. On the horizontal axis, inflation adjusted, is the purchasing power parity of the GDP. And it's a log table. You're all engineers. You understand this stuff. I normally have to explain it. The numbers double along the horizontal axis. As you can see here, the average American in 1940 was living just under 65. That's why they retired at 60. They were gone at 65. Look at the average Chinese, the big red bubble. Didn't make it past 35 and were earning six or seven hundred dollars a year before Mao Zedong. The big pale blue line is uh, dot is India. The dark blue are all African countries. We didn't live beyond 35 in this continent. We earned about seven hundred dollars a year. Now look what happens in one person's lifetime. I'm going to go back and forth so your eye can adjust. But look at the revolution produced by science and technology and engineering. It's an astonishing story. We are living in the great acceleration. So just look at that. Now the Americans right up in the top right. Look where India and China have moved to. Look at all the Europeans gathered. Even in Africa we live 20 years longer. Let's go back and just look at the great leap in one generation. And what has caused this? You know what's caused this. You deal with what's caused this every single day of your life. The Internet of Things, the capacity to communicate at almost zero cost, the ability to move ideas and products and people and produce all around the world, the global supply chains of which you are an integral part have changed the world we work and live in. I want to share with you this morning, it's just the beginning of this change. The Internet and all of its consequences are still gathering momentum. We will have the driverless car. We are able to navigate in ways we never have before. We're able to move massive amounts of information at almost zero cost. The FDA recently approved the first 3D printing pill. You will make the pill in your home. This, these revolutionary, landscape-changing, life-changing technologies are always difficult to understand until we look back and we say, why didn't we think of that? And what I want to say to you is, I'm an optimist about the world. In my lifetime, we've gone from two and a half billion to seven billion. This has never been done. 
as you will see on this slide, we are living in the great, great acceleration. I, you can be scared by this and say, how can we sustain the planet? I want to talk about human ingenuity and how human ingenuity has led to wave after wave of innovation in how we live and where we live and how we earn our livings and how we relate to each other. And I've come through a lifetime of peaceful existence. By, yes, there's scraps and fights even in our own country. But by and large, South Africa has made huge progress in 20 years. We've gone from being a pariah state to being part of the global community. And yes, we are difficult with a difficult transition that may get more difficult. But what's the point of being a citizen if you don't want to deal with the difficulties you face? So I want to, us to think a little bit about that. We are now, according to geologists, in the era of the Anthropocene, the human era. We've had 200,000 years in the Holocene era. I'm talking of geology based on hard science and data. In March of this year, they decided we're in a new era, the Anthropocene era. What does that mean? That humans now move more earth and rock and soil than nature. For some people, that's a horrible idea. But for the seven and a half billion of us on the planet, that is an extraordinary idea. And in my view, something that will endure. I want to go right to the other extreme now and show an example at the micro level of something that really shocked me. You know, I, I used to think Bononi was, was the Far East. And then I made my first trip to Malaysia, and then to Vietnam, and then to China and India, and to Singapore. I've been to Singapore 20 times to see the, this astonishing story of logistics, of planning, of engineering, of how a, a country with zero natural resources, dominated by the British. You know, when, when the British left Singapore, they took everything with them. They tried to move the port, but it wouldn't budge. <laughs> but they took the rest. The colonial secretary wrote a memo to say the Singapore, free Singapore will now be led by Chinese. Chinese are lazy. They'll never get anything done. I don't know if he got his pension. I hope the hell he didn't. Because this little island nation went from an income of $600 per person in 1968 to $65,000 per person now. The average Singaporean earns more than the average American or European with zero natural uh, resources and it imports 90% of its food. And what it's built is a hub. South Africa has to become a hub of services and of production and of capability. Because there is no other plan. That is the plan. And so Singapore is a remarkable story of visionary leadership. Let me show you another country that was part of my youth, Vietnam. When I was a youngster at university, the Vietnam War was on the go. It was an ugly war. It was a difficult war. It was in all the movies. And so I went there as soon as I could. And I want to show you the hotel that I stayed in, in Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon, in an alleyway for $27, a large room with Wi-Fi, DSTV and aircon. I've stayed there for a total of nine days on two trips. I've never had a service error. Now that hotel in the alleyway, I'm going to show you the entrance. There's the entrance to the hotel. On the right is a menu, 34 pages, 130 items on the menu. Not a single meal pre-prepared, everything cooked to order. My first morning there, I asked for pawpaw. They brought me a plate of pawpaw. I thought they'd given me a sculpture. They'd hand carved the pawpaw into the detailed shape of a flower. This is extraordinary. What is it about the culture that allows them to deliver effortless service? You can see this is just a little cheap hotel for an economy traveling professor. You can see people eating. Let me show you the kitchen where they make this. I'm going to go back into the alley. It's on the left of that alley. There's the kitchen. And if you look at this picture, you've got to get where we've got to get to. Everybody's doing something. You can see the walks. You can see the microwaves and the fridges and the spices and the noodles and the gallery. Everybody's doing something. Everybody's got to contribute because if we don't build an inclusive economy, if we don't deal with the 20 million people we are leaving behind, South Africa cannot be stable and prosperous. But more about that later. I'll share one more with you. I love sharing this story because it's so specific. About 100 meters away is an art shop. 
These are hand-painted copies, like Xerox, every copy an original. So for $20, you can have a hand-painted Monet or Van Gogh or cartoon. I tested them with a small Kodak photograph. Do you remember Kodak? No longer exists. Kodak, a small Kodak photo of my daughter Jordan when she was eight. And I learned in Asia, you learn to speak Asian. How long, how much? <laughs> they said 24 hours, $25 to do a hand-painted portrait of my daughter. That's the world. That's what the world is hungry for. Service, value, creativity, hard bloody work. In the background is the guy who painted it. They've taken it off the little frame, those are on little pine frames, and they put it into a tube for me to take on the aeroplane. I got back to Joburg and asked my PA to find out, to frame it back into the pine frame. How long, how much? Three weeks, 400 rand, he said. <laughs> Let me share with you one or two things about where we are. So South Africa is a country in transition. And these are some of the features about us. We've got a huge middle class. This middle class is a new middle class that's emerged in 20 years after decades of not being allowed to compete and not having access to what you and I would take for granted. It's a fantastic feature of South Africa because deeply South Africans are conservative. We're a conservative country and it's the middle class always that hold the country together. And our middle class is growing I'm not talking about those who've left behind, I'm talking about the educated middle class working in banks and cell phone companies and retailers and logistics businesses. And we have to find out about each other. We have to be far more curious about how we've each got in the room and what we're doing in the room. We have to know and understand each other much, much more deeply than we do. Two years ago I was driving through northern Italy, very beautiful, up the Po Valley. And I was driving on back roads and noticed Factory, farm, factory, factory, farm. Here's some of the richest agricultural land with unbelievable engineering firms. And you all know in northern Italy we make Ferrari, Lamborghini, Maserati. How is it they do that in northern Italy? But in the south of Italy, it's pasta and shotguns. How come this incredible difference in one country with one history? We've got to close the gap between those who have and those who don't. We have a small population. Demography determines a country's future, the number of people. To build decent scale, you need a couple of hundred million. Our neighbors are small economies. If you add Namibia, Botswana, uh, Zim, Lesotho, and Swaziland to Mozambique, they are 22% of our GDP. This is one of the illusions of South Africa. We isolate it too much. I've made a proposal that we switch Zim and Nigeria. <laughs> I think if we got 140 million energetic Nigerians on the border, we'd catch a wake up. <laughs> if you've been to Lagos, you'll know what I'm talking about. How many of you have been to Lagos? Hands up. Quite a few of you. It's the most energetic city I've ever been to in my life. Would you agree? It's the scariest place I've ever been to. But it's full of energy. 18 million Nigerians in Lagos with zero infrastructure. Think of the potential. I always remember the first business book I ever read was Barter Shoes. Barter Shoes send their guy into Ghana to figure out the future of shoes. And they write a report after three weeks of going to villages and towns. There's no potential for shoes here. 90% of Ghanaians don't wear shoes. And then the opposition sent their guy around, same research, same town, same villages. He wrote back and said, massive potential for shoes. 90% of them don't wear shoes. <laughs> Yet. I was with MTN when they launched in Nigeria. There were 400,000 landlines for 140 million people. It meant one in 300 people had access to a phone. Today there are 95 million cell phones in Nigeria. This is an extraordinary revolution that's got to happen. So we've got to get numbers, and our numbers are in the region. We know that. So there we go. Those are some of the features. I want to talk about the youth. I once gave a talk in a community hall where, when I'd finished, it was a very difficult talk to give because I had school kids and retirees and domestic workers and executives. 
And at the end of it, when I'd given this overview of, the, of where we are, this old guy in the front, he must have been 80, he looked at me and he said, uh, I was Q&A, and he said, I don't have a question, I've just got a comment. So I said, yes, please go ahead. He looked up at me and he said, I think your generation are going to wreck this country. <laughs> Every generation must think that the previous generation are getting it wrong. That's what we call human progress. South Africa has a generation that is wanting to challenge us. It's challenging us to innovate and to think differently and to be more inclusive. And the one thing I can promise you about our future is if we are not more inclusive, if we don't reach out, if we don't share what we know, as we are doing, more and more, we can't compete. We came from a century of being a mining economy. We are not a mining economy anymore. I come from Cape Town. So when I got to Joburg, I discovered this city, the city of gold. And then I remembered Juta history books. Do you remember Juta? 1652. Do you remember that? The Dromedaris. Most of you know that. And Hendrik Potgieter and his 4 by 4 You remember that? <laughs> Joburg, I was introduced to this crazy business flat city, 1886. And then I subtracted 1652 from 1886 and realized we gave the, the Cape Townians a 234-year head start. And then we overtook them in six years. They've still got the mountain, but they've never recovered. <laughs> the world does not need your permission to change. And we need to dig deep into that next generation in faculties of engineering, in computer science, in sciences. We need to build our universities to be the center of knowledge. Universities are no longer the place you train the next generation. Just go and study Singapore and see how they've used the universities to build a knowledge economy. Today, the speed of change of knowledge is so high that we are all lifelong learners. That's what we've got to do and keep doing. So, so this country is full of very interesting things. We are now a services economy, not a mining economy. We've taken a big club in manufacturing. Maybe we'll get some of it back. If we do, it'll be smart manufacturing. To do that, we have to understand the world that you are trying to understand. This world of seamless, integrated uh, supply chain work with high levels of fulfillment with huge levels of accuracy, with tremendous customization. You can stand in a store in Manhattan now, on the street, outside a retail shop, and see a model in the store dressed the way you want to be, and take out your iPhone, and you can tap onto it, and it'll change what's on it, put different colors and different accessories, and dress yourself in the window, and then press a button and order those clothes, and they'll be delivered to your office by 3 o'clock in the afternoon. This speed, this innovation, is just beginning. Coming soon to a theater near us is a very different world. We've got to run like mad to keep up with that world. So here are some things that you want to think about. Strategic leadership and our capacity to get things done. Just work your mind through those. Have you got a concept of your business? Is it competitive? Are you connected in the ecosystem? How will you connect it more deeply and more precisely to the world around you? What is the continuity of your business? What do you know that's going to say the same? Are you, are you willing to put up the fight? Have you got conviction and passion? And then do all your employees have that? And around the Exco, can you convince the other guys in the business, the other men and women around that table, that if this army doesn't march properly, it's no good having a campaign plan? It's the delivery of the practical and the real that is the center of your business. Are we willing to change our minds? Are you going on journeys of learning and journeys of exploration and journeys of experimentation in which you look at your business from another angle? Don't drive the same route to work. It's a really, really bad idea. I want to end by telling you of an experience I had. Uh, before I get there, let me say that uh, as I talk around the country and talk to businesses and talk to people like you, I realize that many South Africans are either optimists or pessimists. We kind of get up in the morning and we think the country is in deep trouble. We get up in the morning and we get excited by the change. 
Normally on Mondays we're feeling good, and by Fridays it's not so good. I don't think whether you're an optimist or a pessimist is the issue. I think what the issue is, are you knowledgeable or naive? Or doff, that's a, another academic term. And so what you get are naive optimists. They don't know what's going on, but it feels good. <laughs> then you get naive pessimists. They don't know what's going on, but it doesn't feel good. And then, of course, you get knowledgeable pessimists. We call them accountants. <laughs> but what we're after, what I think this century is after, all around the world, are the knowledgeable optimists. The people who are prepared to study what is happening around them outside their comfort zone, to explore for the new learning, to look for the new ideas, because all change scares us. There are times when I look at what's happening, I go, how are we possibly going to make this? The Americans have one useful expression that I know of. It says, you can't jump a chasm in two jumps. That is not a good strategy. It needs one jump. We're in the one jump time. Get out there and explore. I've stepped down as the head of Gibbs, which I was privileged to start 17 years ago, and I've spent a year now exploring and studying and thinking about what it is that you and I are going to have to do. And I've got to tell you, I'm filled with enthusiasm. There's so much good that can be done. If each of us just reach out and change the life of one person, each one teach one, pass your knowledge on. This is a relay race to a new generation who in general are hungry for it. And yes, they're going to do crazy things. But they also, we did the same thing. You know, I look around this room and all the men have their ha same hairstyle. If you go back to, uh, I don't know how many of you did military service, we all have that same hairstyle now. I mean then. Right? Each generation defines itself in a particular way. This generation behind us, when I go to universities and I listen to them, to students, not what's in the Sunday paper, when I go to students at university and I see them relating to each other, changing their worldview, engaging internationally, realizing they want to prosper too, I'm filled with hope about the country. So I'm suggesting, as I am, that you are a knowledgeable optimist, but knowledgeable because you're searching for the new. Let me end by telling you an ex a story and experience I had at uh, Home Affairs. How many of you have been to Home Affairs in the last three years? Hands up. All survivors. <laughs> I went to Home Affairs last Monday to get another passport. I took a book, water, and my cell phone. Not a bed, but, a, but I did take water and a book. Because I've spent many, many hours in those long bench queues. You know the ones I'm talking about. I got there at about 3 o'clock. They close at 4. I had six transactions. I walked through the door. The guy said, what do you want? I said, a passport. He said, go to counter one. I was at counter one for a minute. He said, why are you here? I said, I need a passport. He said, thank you. You need to go to counter four. You need 600 bucks. Go to counter four. I went to counter four. My interaction there lasted less than 60 seconds. He relieved me of 600 bucks, which people can do in 60 seconds or under. <laughs> and he said, go to counter six. I waited a minute, got to counter six. Digital photograph. Please sign electronically. I signed. Please give your left thumbprint. Left, right thumbprint. Three minutes later, go sit down, you'll be called. 199, 199, I went to counter eight. There was a woman, also digital, never filled out a form. She looked at the information on the system, verified some information, total of three minutes, digital thumbprint, electronic signature, no photos, we're done. Except that you now, I see, are going to have three passports. That's a challenge. So, okay, here we go. There's three days, thank God I brought the water. Supervisor appeared about a minute later, electronic uh, thumbprint from him, electronic signature to override the system to allow me to have for three months three passports. I left there 18 minutes later. As I left the building, I got an SMS saying, we will SMS you when your, when your passport is ready. As I left the building. I was there for 18 minutes. On Friday morning, I got an SMS, your passport is ready for collection. Not many banks could do that. Most banks want my mother-in-law's blood type. <laughs> now, I want to end by just sharing this with you. Home affairs turn around. Wow. South African business leadership. Wow. The next generation of South Africans taking their place in the world. Wow. A billion people north of us hungry for lunch. Wow. 
It's our game to win, guys. So I wish you well with this conference. I hope you come away, as Mungo said, with some new insights, building your network, but constantly realizing that the rate of change is going to accelerate. The level of competitiveness is going to accelerate. The amount of change we're going to have to deal with is going to become, along with complexity, the drum beats of our time. And we can do this thing. Let's do it together. Thank you very much.